They were like, this is not an assault. This is, we are gassing your building. Do not fire upon us as they're pushing in. This is not an assault. And they're pushing in the front of the building. Sure, it feels like an assault. (laughs) I'm sure that's. uh, You promise? Right, yeah. Yeah. No comment. (laughs) No, we didn't kill Bin Laden. Probably blame me for being an idiot. but and Which you were. Which we all were. <laughs> you have to make it to where crime doesn't pay. You have to deter crime. Whether it's crime or terrorism, it's the same principle. You have to clash with supervision. You have to or nothing will get done. Supervisors can't learn how to supervise. And you can't learn how to respect a supervisor without confrontation. It has to happen. <laughs> Do not take that out. JV team for life. What's up, everybody? Just want to give a quick shout out to Zero Nine Holsters. These guys are cop owned, cop operated, cop tested. All right, based out of Ohio, um, they have gear for everything: holsters, equipment. I use them for magazines, radio. They have everything. So you can either order online through them, or you can go on their website and find who sells them in their shops. In case you're one of those people that wants to go and physically look at it. On this podcast, we talk about real important issues in our culture um it's hard to do sometimes uh you know and a a lot of people don't support us and don't want these messages out there zero nine holsters supports us 100 percent. they agree with everything they that we say and they are like we're down let's do it so by supporting them you're supporting us and uh so if you buy holsters or you know you need equipment holders radio anything you need Go to 09 Holsters, right? And when you check out, use promo code ANTIHERO10Z9. ANTIHERO10Z9. That'll get you 10% off your order. So go show them some love. Thanks, guys. Well, how about this one? How about how about this one? Um, don't bring women and children to a gunfight because they're poor shots. <laughs> <laughs> they lack recoil management. They lack <laughs> recoil management. Or at least teach them where the fire exits are. Go. <laughs> we'll start referring to Magnet as our producer. <laughs> well, at this rate, I can promise you, you'll make as much as we do. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back to the Anti Hero Podcast, part Delta Force, part Street Cop, all podcasts. I'm Tyler, owner of Refracted Wolf Apparel, All American Outsider Apparel. Use promo code Anti Hero for 15% off all the best graphic tees out there. And I'm Brent Tucker, owner of First Responders Coffee and Cigar Company. Use FRCC15, get 15% off of high-quality coffee and great cigars. I just used it. It works. That's right. I was surprised. I thought we had, <laughs> thought we had cut you out of our customer base, but apparently we're going to have to go, go back and, 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 and ban you. FRCC25 does not work. <laughs> I tried it. It started going up all the numbers. Um, today's podcast is going to be... A little different than podcasts we normally do, but I, I think it'll also be a podcast that we, a type of podcast we do a little more of. Yeah. Um, and I'm kind of excited about that, to be honest with you. I'm, I'm a quasi history buff. Yeah, I, I love history. Comes with comes with the territory of, of getting older. You just start liking history for some reason. Um, and uh, the topic is Waco. Not just Waco, but like the origins of like. Mm. Of like David Koresh and he, why? So obviously, I learned a lot, you know, more about David Koresh and the Branch Davidians, uh, you know, doing the research. But the truth is, and a lot like Ruby Ridge, and hopefully we get to talk about that one uh, as well, because there's, there's a lot of comparisons between Waco and, and Ruby Ridge. What I thought was Waco wasn't necessarily uh, the whole truth either. You know, um, it happened back in 19. 19- uh, back in 1993, so a lot of time has has come and gone. I was I was 12 years old at the time. You know, probably a lot of our listeners were uh, were of that age or maybe younger, maybe a little bit older. But you know, they weren't. It's not like a lot of our listeners are going to be 30 or 40 at the time. And I'm sure it was big news at the time, and people watched their their TV sets you know every day during the 51 day siege. Um, and then again, even those listeners 
uh, if you do remember Waco, you only got the story of what the news media told you, yeah. which was being fed by the F by, by the feds. So which wasn't, you know, necessarily the whole truth. So, yeah. And this is just like you said earlier, this is the there's no better story in America. Not better. I don't want to use the word better, but there's no more like a story that's just like I can't there's no right answers to it. There's no like. I, this was the right side, or this was the right side. Um, I'll, and uh, again, I hate to keep talking about uh, Ruby Ridge because um, we'll—I think we'll do a podcast on that. Mm-hmm. I, 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 I'm very fascinated by that story as well. Um, but Ruby Ridge, Ruby Ridge is a little more cut and dry because if if you do or don't know about Ruby Ridge, um, and again, you probably don't know the whole story about yeah. Ruby Ridge. So I'm excited about doing a podcast about that. It, you know, that was a Green Beret uh, in '92 barricaded with his family in the mountains of Idaho and it was a lot easier to um to understand or be you know kind of more lenient towards towards his story Mm -hmm. the problem with Waco is is the people in the uh you know the people doing the siege is or being sieged uh were radical religious weirdos and so it was a lot it's a lot less you know it, it's a lot harder to to have a, a soft heart towards them because like well you're weirdos it's what weirdos get but to me that's why it's important to go down the history of david crash go down the history of the branch davidians and i'm not going to sit here and tell you the branch davidians were great people and you know uh and deserve to be protected and that's your ideal american citizen but what i will say is this the Branch Davidians started back in the 1920s. They had been here for a hundred years and known how to problem with them for a hundred years. And at the end of the day, they lived in America and that was their American dream. And everyone wants to talk about we're a melting pot and diversity. And then when these guys are living their American dream, people have no problem, you know, taking it away from them. And uh, I, talk- and I have a problem with that. Are you talking about the David Koresh era? We had a problem with it. Or are you talking about like? Because what? Was- no, I'm talking just. I, I I'm just like when people hear the Waco story, you know, they 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 seem to think, oh, well, they're just they're just religious fanatic wackos, mm-hmm. uh, you know, multiple wives, young kids, uh, and I'll get into that. And there is some truth of that. And I'm not trying to paint them as saints. They are not saints, but I also don't believe they're the evil that the feds would have liked to paint them as because it had been a lot easier to, uh, you know, to, it had been a lot more palatable that 80 plus Americans died yeah. that, that were, that were evil antagonists when that's just not necessarily the whole truth. Mm. I'm interested. I'm interested because I, as the timeline goes, it goes Ruby Ridge then it goes Waco. Mm. And then there's a direct correlation to the Oklahoma city bombing, which is, you know, that's something I didn't know either until I, I started pulling yeah. this string. And you think the Oklahoma City bomber is is uh, some deranged weirdo, which he is. N- n- no, do not pull this out of context. Absolutely is. But I never understood why anyone would do that. And after doing research into Ruby Ridge and Waco and what the government did to those to those people, I'm just saying I understand why how it, it happened w- how it happened yeah. and how that would turn a fanatic to be his last straw to do something yeah doesn't make it right yes Does not exactly. make it right but uh, it, it it kind of connected some pieces and so and you're right even that it all they all kind of um uh they're all connected ruby ridge waco and the oklahoma city bomber um uh with timothy mcveigh uh all uh, was the domino effect of how the government handled themselves in in the early nineties. Yeah, there's a common there's a common theme of being shredded on. <laughs> but, yeah, and, you know, and, and and it is a little ironic, you know, me doing this because um, I'm sure some people will, will will see this and be like, oh, you know, if you're a fringe right wing, like, oh, Brent's on our side, you know, he's uh, he's an all anti government and conspiracy theorist, and that's just that couldn't be any further from, further from the truth. I'm not anti government. Don't get me wrong. I'm very much for smaller government, but I'm not anti-government. I'm not much of a conspiracy theorist. Um, that being said, do I think do I think our government's batting a thousand since 1776? <laughs> no, no, they're not. And and we've been very consistent about this. 
We're very pro law enforcement. That's evident by both of our companies and and the job you yeah. do. And Magnus pro ATF. And Mag- <laughs> 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 but Just- <laughs> but but we're not but we're not scared to call people out either. We have the dumbass cop of the week, mm-hmm. you know. And that's that's what you that's what that's what really we should do as mouthpieces is support. Uh, people who deserve to be supported, but also keep them honest and call them out when wrongdoings uh, happen or have happened. And we have to learn from things like this to ensure that it never happens again. Like you have to know what your government is yeah. capable of. And exactly. And these these were arms of government law enforcement. These were agencies of federal law enforcement. And, you know, like you look at the street cop and he's a, he's a guy for the people. He upholds the Constitution. You know, the feds... I think just have a different playbook and operate well, on a different set of rules. That's why, you know, a sheriff will say, eh, I'm not, I'm not enforcing that. And then the feds will come in and enforce whatever the hell they want. Well, in this particular situation, and, and I agree with you, uh, you know, there's, there's good players there's bad players. And sometimes, you know, the, the smaller, you know, counties will, will, you know, and uh, entities will give pushback and then get overruled. But let me tell you who was all a part of this. You had six. You had six hundred and sixty-eight federal agents on the scene. You had fifteen U.S. Army personnel. Um, we had thirteen National Guard members. We had seventy-one Texas Rangers and one hundred and sixty-six local police officers, totaling a n- almost nine hundred man force up against Waco. They are coming to tread. <laughs> and it, but but yeah, yeah yeah oh and on man it's with, as, with as, tanks <laughs> yeah yep and that's uh the irony of of that statement is is definitely gonna ring true here in a little bit about about the treads and don't tread on me and they absolutely tread on them um so that being said let's get into it yeah let's get in you want to do the history of david yep All right. yep i uh i'm not excited about doing it this way uh but there's so much information to cover and there is no way that I'm going to remember it all. I had to write a bunch of notes, and I'm going to do uh, a fair amount of reading. But uh, it just it, it just is what it is to be historically right and and, and get the get the get uh, get the story right. So for this part of the story, I'm actually going to refer to him as Vernon Howell because that's his name. I did not know that. And there you go. I'm 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 excited that I did the uh, kind of the history part of it because you're going to get to you know. Uh, hear it for the first time as well and get and get the reaction of of who uh vernon howell was vernon howell was born in houston in 1958 his mother bonnie sue was 14 years old as soon as uh she was found out to be pregnant um the dad left so he he, he never met his dad um bonnie Right before uh, he, he was born, Bonnie hooked up with a, uh, a guy fresh out of prison who was an alcoholic and violent and wanted nothing to do with, uh, with her son. And she had him uh, give her son away to, to the grandparents. So she's mom of the year at this point. So, mom, yeah. mom of the year. Yeah. So right off the bat, we can stop there, and yeah. and and you and you can now understand a lot more about yeah. about about uh, the person you know as David Koresh and how someone. If this is your beginning, we've talked about another podcast. You know, we talked about it on Raising Alphas. We've talked about it with the uh, the biblical podcast with my brother. How important the family structure is to have a a, a father and a mother having them both present in someone's life because when you don't. This is what happens, yep. and you can go and say, "Well, that's that's a you know that's that's cherry picking. That's not cherry picking. I mean, I'm not saying they're all going to turn into David Koresh's, but the statistics aren't with you for that person to grow up and be a productive citizen." Yeah. So I don't think is going to raise any eyebrows that uh, that was uh, his early childhood. It gets worse, um, and get, and it gets weirder. Uh, he goes to live with his grandparents. Um, his grandparents, who are still young because his mom had him when, when she was 14, his grandparents then have two more kids um, after he goes to, to live with them as, as a baby. And so he was raised, i got to say this right, he was raised with his aunt's sister and his uncle brother. That were younger than him. That were younger than him. <laughs> so um, the his mom... Gets remarried and gets remarried to to uh, to uh, 
apparently a, a pretty good guy and kind of gets her life back on the on, on the right track. Uh, Royal uh, Roy um, Roy Holder. Uh, I'm sorry, Roy Holdersman. Um, and uh, he's a decent guy, and he's like, "Hey, yeah, you know, I want you to bring, I want you to bring your son back. We're gonna, we're gonna raise this family." They end up having uh, another, uh, another son who has a half brother, um, but uh, and brings Vernon uh, back to Dallas to live with them. Now, he's like, if I remember, he's like five years old when this, when when this is happening, and so when his grandmother and aunt and uncle would come visit him he would cry uncontrollably begging to go home with his mom which was his grandma he'd call her mom his Ooh. his grandma and uh his his aunt and uncle so he's at a very young age he's just very he's very troubled you know yeah. that's, that's just a that's a lot to unpack there The as the story goes, Roy, his uh, his new dad, um, was cold and hard on on both his sons, and they grew up in a rough part of of Dallas. Um, at age eight, Vernon was uh, cornered and sexually assaulted in a barn. Um, that's again, it just got. I keep on like peeling back these layers, and you're like, yeah, uh, that's was the dad hard as in like hard for back like back in the day when dads were hard or was he like un- out of Man, that's a good question I, I i don't know but i did read several uh articles about his, you know him him growing up and they actually both um or all of them you know referred to how how hard-nosed uh, his dad was but you yeah. know i'm not even saying that's a bad thing that's you know it's just a thing my dad was very, i was gonna say you, was, you sound- was a very hard-nosed uh guy to, uh growing up um but I can tell you this: my dad wouldn't would not let uh, anyone sexually assault me, and there would have been hell to pay for that. Yeah. So I, you know, uh, obviously there's no one to talk to in that story. But you know, I'd love to dig deeper in that. And you know, did his dad even know? What did his dad do about that? Um, you know, was he, was he too scared to even tell his parents? But uh, obviously, someone someone knew because the truth came out. And at eight, he was cornered and sexually assaulted in a barn. Um, he was described as lanky, awkward. Um, he was dyslexic, so school was very hard on him. Um, he repeated the first grade, and in third and fourth grade, he was put into special special ed classes. Um, and his nickname throughout elementary school was Mr. Retardo. <laughs> Guy had a tough, tough oh, childhood. Oh, man, that's not even a clever nickname that's no, just a well, fucking <laughs> elementary school kids aren't known for their cleverness they don't want to just wow, go with the, the the you know the the clear one in front of them and that's what they went with um <laughs> but the truth is even though he he had all those things going against him he was far from retarded um he gravitated towards music mechanics and religion and he could take things apart he could fix them put them back together uh and th- that type of you know intellectual prowl that that takes smarts you yeah. know to to be an engineer and, and mechanics. Um, um, by age fourteen, he had, according probably to him or to some people, he had memorized the whole Old Testament. Now, if that's true, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, and 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 to me, it's one of those things. That even if it's not true. I bet he memorized a whole lot of the Old Testament, a lot, lot more than, a lot more than I memorized, yeah. uh, and and more than he could know, read. He could tell you the Old Testament almost verbatim. Probably. That's 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 the claim. Um, school is unforgiving still, and it was it was agreed that he should move back with his his grandmother. It's around middle school time with Tyler, um, Tyler, Texas, to get a to get a fresh start. Um, and man, that and that was the right call. Man, that was the right call. Um, he was gonna go. He was supposed to share a room with his uncle brother, um, and immediately upon seeing that, he looked back in the shed and said, "You know what? Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna remodel that shed. I'm gonna live in the shed," and that's what he did. 
and he remodeled the shed by himself. And you know, according to the stories, that any, everyone who came and visited him in that shed were like, "Man, this is really nice." Um, he continued to learn. He taught himself how to play guitar. Uh, he, tur- he continued to play guitar. He starts kind of coming into his own, and now he's a a confident guy. He he would have girls, you know, come over to to his. He had friends in the neighborhood. He was uh, welcomed at this new school. He got a fresh start. He wasn't Mr. Retardo anymore. He's a kid who can play guitar, lives, even even though it doesn't sound cool right now, but as a middle schooler, you, you live it in your own place, yeah. you know, even in a shed. People can come over, stay up as late as you want. You're kind of a cool kid. So he's starting to kind of come into his own uh, with this with this fresh start. Um, he's, even kinda, he's even looked at as a, a handsome young rocker, uh, I read one article that later on in life that he actually moved to to L.A. because mm-hmm. he wanted to be uh, he wanted to be uh, uh, in a rock band. Um, and he was he was looked at as persuasive, insightful, and even inspiring. So, um, I mean, again, this fresh start did did a lot for him. But at age sixteen, uh, he had to move back with his parents. And it was agreed upon by his friends and family. And here's what's crazy to me when you read this story. Even his principal and school teachers, that he should not go back to the same public school system that he grew up in. Yeah. That must have been pretty bad then. If everybody's yeah. if everybody's <laughs> like, yeah. So they all agreed. Um, they put him in a private school called Dallas Junior Academy, which is a seven-day Adventist uh, school. And he was, ex- uh, he was accepted. Um, but he continued to learn about the Bible and he started getting into, and now he's a confident, you know, now he's a confident young man. He knows a lot about the Bible. Uh, do you know and he's challenging his professors and his teachers at this high school and he's challenging them to a point where they can't, they can't defeat him. Does he have mentally. any outside Christian influence on him or is this all interest that he has his his mother is deeply religious okay um i didn't hear anything about his his grandmother being deeply uh religious but yeah his his mom's religious um and uh and he's defined and he's starting to outsmart his own instructors yeah and really he's outsmarting his own instructors and what i really what kind of um hit me with this is it's a little bit like a he has this weird, he's a, he's a weird hybrid, right? Because he loves guitar, he loves rock music, and he also loves religion. Well, in, in the in the 70s, what, what's, what's rock music stand for? And which is kind of more what, yeah. what punk rock stands for now. Being being defiant, you know, not conforming, and not, you know, being unapologetic about, about the truth. And so that kind of becomes uh, his, his personality. But he has the mental capacity and the understanding and the zeal for the Bible to back it up. So, uh, <clears throat> and it was well known that he knew more about the Bible than most of his teachers. Um, was he in a, re- do you know if his uh, new school was religious based or no? Yeah. Yeah. His it new was. school was, okay. it was absolutely religious based. It was a school, uh, founded by, uh, seventh day Adventist. It, okay. was, it was a, it was a Christian school. Um, so Vernon, he's now confident, uh, he's knowledgeable and even arrogant. Um, and he head and he butted heads with so many of the teachers, and again was probably right um, that they they couldn't beat him, so they told him to beat feet. Uh, they kicked him out of school. Uh, he moved back to his grandma, uh, his grandma's house. He drops out of school uh, completely, and at this point he kind of loses his religion. He's he doesn't really know what to do with his life. He starts doing carpenter jobs, and he picks up carpenter jobs where his grandma lives. Uh, in Tyler and where his mom lives in Dallas and he's going back and forth. He kind of can't hold down a job um, He's just drifting from job site to job site and he turns to womanizing and he's got girlfriends and in, in both towns um, He's getting back at everybody for calling him Mr. Retardo. <laughs> that's right. That's right <laughs> and and really like and to me when you start hearing this background out of him you start seeing this re- this theme and this beginning mold of 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 a of a guy who got no attention and only negative attention yeah. and then he 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 finds a way to reinvent himself and now he's kind of a ladies man and now he's womanizing you know taking advantage of all his missed opportunities um and you know the, the womanizing and wanting to be accepted and all that you know will come into play later uh with the branch davidians but this happens at a, at a young age. 
and this is reoccurring as well. Well, I'll show you some more. Um, and when he's 19, he knocks up a 15-year-old. Ooh. Now, I will tell you this, and again, a reoccurring theme. Uh, I'm not telling you that's right, but I'm going to tell you it's legal. It wasn't until the 2000s in Texas that they raised the age of consent from 14 to 18. So, it was legal. Um, and just because it's legal doesn't make it right, especially in his parents' eyes. His parents' eyes were furious. Uh, when I say his, I'm sorry, her parents' eyes. The 15-year-old's parents were furious and make sure he is not part of the child's life at all, uh, which I'm sure was a, uh, a tough hit on him. At this point, he goes back to searching for purpose, um, and he comes back to church. The church takes him in. Now he has this, you know, this, you know, this sorry story about, uh, you know, I was living a life of sin. I got a girl pregnant. Now her parents didn't want me. And they're like, oh, you poor child, you know, get, get your life right and, and come to church. But kind of the, the, the broken record here, just like his, his private school days, um, he knows more than most people at church. And really, that's, that's a shame on you church people, that yeah. you don't know enough about your own religion. Um, and, uh, he, he's quickly accepted as a, you know, as a, as a young scholar, a very knowledgeable person. Uh, he now has like this kind of charming personality as well that he can, he can bring people in. Um, but he kind of turns into this tyrant that, uh, that for the smallest infraction a church member does, like he comes in and Bible thumps him and comes down heavy on him. Um, and so he gets known for that. Um, at one point. He falls in love with a preacher's daughter, and uh, that's a rebel for you. Oh, yeah, I know. The, his his rebel part just can't his his rocker part just can't co completely go away. And this is, I believe, the beginning of him. And I get it. He knows more than the people at at the church. Why shouldn't he be in charge? Or or what's his next step to? to leadership he wants to be a leader so bad and to be you know affiliated with the pastor's daughter kind of kind of fast forwards them into that and this is the beginning of what i'm now i'm putting the pieces together in that this is but it's it's quite evident in just a very few a very few years here in the future that that's a problem well he comes to the pastor and says hey god told me uh, told me that uh, i'm supposed to take your daughter as a wife and the pastor Kicks him out. No, no he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> the pastor disagreed and kicks him out of church. But as you can see, he's all, he's a troublemaker, you know, and, and, you know, in one aspect. I'm sure he, the pastor is tired of him uh, riling up the congregation, yeah. admonishing people over small things. And it's like, you know what? We brought you in and you're just more trouble than you're worth. And now you're telling me that God's talking to me, talking to you. And to give you my daughter, that's probably the final straw for him. Mm -hmm. So at this point, uh, he gets really into uh, revelations and the end times. And uh, he stumbles um, He stumbles on this, uh, the, this revelation seminar um, and taught by James Gilly. Now, James Gilly was unique in the fact that he he wouldn't just teach the Old Testament or the New Testament, the the revelations. He would put a creative spin on it and he'd have these elaborate shows and then he would pull in um, news headlines at the time and, you know, and show how they line up with revelations. And and a ton of people were, were gravitating towards this, including including Vernon Howell. He gets so caught up into this. He comes up to James Gilly and says, hey, I know a lot about the Bible, too. I'm a pretty personable guy. You know what we should do? We should expand this thing. And uh, and you you let me take this show as well. And we can reach twice as many people. Now, I will tell you from one aspect from a Christian side. Why wouldn't you if you believe this to be true? Why wouldn't you want more people to hear about it? Um, maybe it was the way he he approached him on it. But as you can see. Once again, he's trying to fast track to be the guy behind the pulpit. He wants to be the guy that everyone, you know, everyone's listening and respecting him. He wants to be a leader so bad. 
um, James Gilly hears his uh, hears his um, his pitch and says and says he was not interested. So he misses you know, another opportunity a, to try to be a leader. Was that a money making opportunity for that for that gentleman that he would have lost out on? As a businessman, I, I, as a straight businessman, I'd have said, I'd have, I'd have said, hey, is he the right guy for the job? Absolutely. Let's double this up. Let's bring in more money. You know, you, and I'll, I'll keep a percentage of it. You know, it's just like a, uh, it's just like if you were, um, you know, expanding, you know, franchising. Uh, franchising. It's just yeah. like you were franchising. So, uh, for whatever reason, I don't know why he didn't want to do it, but he wasn't interested at all. And this really is the catalyst that sends him looking for a new home again. And he wanders, um, uh, he's, he goes to Waco and he wanders into this religious commune. Um, was he, did he purposely go to Waco or just happened to be in Waco? Do you know that? I don't know. Okay. I don't know what, what took him to Waco. Gotcha. But I know he ends up there, and I know he ends up there, which is where the Branch Davidians are. Yep. And that's what that's what connects him to the Branch Davidians. Now, let's take a step back. Now we know who we know who David Koresh is. Well, we know his he's Vernon. But Vernon he's, Howell. He's Vernon Howell. Let's find out who the Branch Davidians are. So the Branch Davidians originated in the 1920s. They were act, they're, uh, actually called the Shepherd's Rod originally, or nicknamed the Davidians. Um, they had 200 acres of land. They were a self-sustaining group. They were strict Bible followers, um, and they believed contact with the outside world was harmful. Um, they eventually expand to 300 acres as the population increased, and the... Um, the founder of them predicted the end of the world was going to happen in the 1950s. That's a common mistake by by occultists. And I don't know why. I don't know why they think that's a good thing. It put never a date had, on it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah don't put never, a date on it. Never put a date on it. Yeah. It never. It, it never ends well. And uh, he he's got too full of himself. He puts a date on it. Surprisingly enough, if you're hearing this podcast, you know how that ends because we're still here. It doesn't happen. And in 1955, he dies. And his wife, Florence, takes over um, Shepherd's Rod. She's, they're, they're continuing to grow. She sells the property, and she buys 1,000 acres. Now, for, for a guy looking at land himself right now, I'm thinking, man, I can't afford land. Maybe I start a cult. It's mm-hmm. a good way to get 1,000 acres. Religious exemption. <laughs> <laughs> man. Um, so they buy 1,000 acres. Um, and then, crazy enough... Just like, uh, um, just like her late husband, she makes her own claim of 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 an ending of the world is happening in 1955. Um, surprise, surprise again, it does not happen, and it and it uh, doesn't end well. Uh, in 19 and and they have a bunch of people leave. They actually had a a, a massive amount of people flock to them, thinking it was into the, the world. And they were all going to spend their last days together. When it didn't happen, uh, a lot of people left. And when a lot of people left um, in 62, she disbanded the Davidians and she sells the land. Well, one of the one of the branches of the Davidian was so, the oh, Branch Davidians. The branch Davidians. Okay. Um, was uh, Ben Roden. Um, ben Roden in 1973... Um, he buys back some of the original land and 77 acres worth and gets the band back together. Yep. Right. Back in their original land, he buys Kind of like Leonard Skinner, like not the full band, but mm. just enough to where you can still. Just enough where you can still make music. Um, he, he, he's, he gets a little smarter and he wisely prophesies that the end of the world is that Jesus is going to come back, but he doesn't put a date on it. He says, if spirit. Spiritual maturity is reached. Jesus will come back. 
what a yeah what a kind obscure a broad <laughs> right right so he has no he has he has he has uh he has no intentions of giving up power uh based on a date coming and going if spiritual maturity is reached Jesus will come back um Ben Roden is growing older and and a power and struggle incurs for the next leader between his wife um Lu, uh Luis and his son George this is where it gets kind of interesting And it is. It's all about power. It, it really is with these guys. So um, Luis pulls a fast one because she's going to have to you know, fight basically her son for the for, for the power of this organization. And she says the Holy Spirit came to her and told her that the next leader would be a feminine figure. No, the Holy Spirit came to me. <laughs> she's not saying it's her. She's just saying it's not you, son. It's going to be a, a feminine figure um, because of her, her, her seniority and because what the Holy Spirit says. This allows her to become the next leader of the Branch Davidians. Um, her son George reportedly wasn't very happy about this, but he knew his mom was growing older. It was, you know, was like, it's all right. I'll just, I'll just wait out the old hag. She'll die, and I'll, and I'll, I'll be leader. Well, until 1981, that was a good plan because a guy named Vernon walks in to the Branch Davidians and starts dating a 77-year-old named Louise. <laughs> He's 23 at the time. <laughs> if that, I I foreshadowed There's this. There's no motive. <laughs> no motive. No motive. I foreshadowed this. I said, this guy really wants to be, you know, looked up to. He really wants to be a leader. He really wants, this is how dedicated this man is to being a leader. That old lady's like, let's go get you that throne. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't that bad? <laughs> so, uh, he's eventually allowed to preach. Um and he is uh, eventually declared the successor in 86 when uh, Louise dies. By now, her? By her? By Grace. her. Grace. Okay. Yep. Now, of course, this doesn't sit well with George, uh, who's been probably faking this cult thing the whole time just so he could be a leader. Now he faked all this time for nothing. So the power struggle between George and Vernon, uh, it gets weird and it gets violent. George has to now like prove that that Vernon is not this, uh, you know, this prophet and man of God and has no powers. So he, he digs up uh, an an old dead body of the member of the cult, lays the dead body at Vernon's feet, and says, "If you're really who you say you are, you'll raise this lady from the dead." Well. Vernon knows he can't raise anyone from the dead, and so he does the next best thing, and he goes into town and tells the cops, hey, I'm pretty sure it's illegal. This guy's digging up dead bodies. (laughs) Snitching on your enemies. (laughs) Well, and if you think about it, smart move by the the, the cop, and, you know, the sheriff's like, you know what? I'm not going on you weirdos' land, uh, you know, based off of what, what you said. He goes... Get, take a photograph of the dead body and the and the dug and the and the grave dug up, and if you show me proof for this, I'll come out there. So, um, Vernon and his man, his his gang of of merry men, go sneaking around. The body's now like at uh, um, somewhere close to George's house, and they go sneaking around in the morning to go get a picture of the dead body. Um, George sees them coming up to the dead body with a camera. And a firefight ensues. So a firefight ensues. George ends up uh, getting hit in the arm. George goes to the sheriff, says, hey, he shot me. Vernon goes to court, gets arrested. Him and his, his cronies go to court, and they all get released um, on, on self-defense charges because um, George shot first. So... Um, Vernon and his followers leave, but but George, who's, who's I don't know when he got nicknamed this, but his nickname is the Madman of Week, uh, the Madman of Waco. The Ver, Vernon and his followers leave. George is now there, left to to rule the roost with the majority of the people and the land that his 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 mom you know uh, originally bought, and life is is fi- finally fine with George, except he can't help himself, and one of his weirdo followers. Um, Self-proclaimed himself to be the Messiah, and George promptly hits him in the head with an axe and kills him. Mm. 
and spends the rest of his life in prison and goes to a mental hospital. So now that George is gone, Vernon hears about this, and he's like, you know what? I guess there's no more power struggle anymore. Yeah, power vacuum. Daddy's coming back. So they, re- they return. Um, he becomes the leader of, of the Branch Davidians, and within a certain time period, uh, he marries, one of the first things he does, he marries a 14-year-old. Well, like I told you, that is legal in Texas. You, you may not like it, but he's, it's legal. Um, the in 1990, for I, I read a couple different um, reasons for this. Some people said that, uh, and, if, and I actually listened to it. You can go listen to David Kresh music. He's got he's got his music uh, out there. He released music. Um, he probably didn't think the name Vernon Howell was a very cool name uh, to buy music from, so he came up with the name David Kresh. David from the biblical name King David, and um, there was uh, I can't I can't remember the exact story. Koresh after the name of some kind of a uh, Roman or uh, uh, military person uh, back in Roman times who defended Jews, and so his name was Koresh. We came up with the name David Koresh. Um, that happened again. That happened in 1990. So when he's now that he's the leader, the undisputed leader of branch of the Branch Davidians, he actually does some good things. Um, George was needing money, and he started renting out some of the houses to some crooked people. One of them was <clears throat> some meth dealers who had a meth lab in their house. And David Kress says, not on my watch. You guys get out of here. And actually calls the cops on him, gets him arrested, kind of cleans up the place. Um, you can say a lot of things about David, and he is a weirdo, and I'm not, I'll, I'll refer to him as David now. Um, but he did seem, he did seem to be, you know, oddly, um, I don't know what the word I want to use, you know, right, you know, kind of justified. Like, you don't, you mean, it's like he he walks, he yeah. walks, he, he, just enough. he tips toes down the line, you know. I'm sure. I'm sure if the age of consent was 13, he'd have married a 13 year old. You know, um, and even though eventually he says you're allowed to marry more than more than one person, well, only he is. Yeah. He eventually makes up this rule that all the males here have to be celibate, but I'm the only person that can have. Uh, he dissolves all their marriages, uh, and then he takes all their wives. And that's correct. And he and he said, hey, it's been prophesied to me that I have to have 24 sons. And. Um, and by the way, you guys can't have sex anymore because sex is bad. It's not for you. I don't want to do this, but yeah. someone has to make these 24 kids, and it's got to come from me. So I'm going to have to have sex. You're welcome. You're, I'm, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah. But he legally never takes another wife because that would be against the law. Mm-hmm. So he does a good job of, of, of tiptoeing down uh, this, th- this line legally. And I point that out because um, I, I will say – I'll. Spoiler alert, he does do some illegal things, but he does do a good job of of being within, uh, of not bringing, I believe he knew, he knew it would bring unneeded and unwarranted attention if... if uh, Unnecessarily breaking the law. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Um, he eventually has 12 children with eight women, so, and they're all 14 and over, so he's trying. Um and they started legal businesses uh, to uh, to create wealth for for the families. So they have over a hundred people living in the Branch Davidian community. Um, um, by the way, they're all living in separate houses. So when you look at the Branch Davidian compound as you now see it, this is how this is how we did it. He instructed every member to dismantle their homes and to take all the construction materials, and they're going to build one big home from all your little homes. They went. They went transformer with it, well, and I so know. I didn't know that. Yeah, um, and I'm sure it was a. Uh, it, it it's was, hard enough to sell T-shirts and coffee to people. Can you imagine selling this idea to people and have them go, "Okay"? <laughs> like people back again, then. I know it sounds weird. Like I'm like I'm giving this guy credit, but I give credit where credit's due. Like what? Like as a leader, you know, to have people have that type of trust in you. you yeah. When a guy tells you. You'll dismantle your home and they do it that's crazy i don't i don't know take a step back i don't know if that proves what a great leader he was or just what a what a sucker these guys was 
And the truth is, it's probably somewhere. Yeah, he's probably like a great narcissist and a great influencer and a great manipulator and mixed yeah, with good words. Yeah, manipulator, influencer. Yeah. So this this compound that they end up building, let me just tell you about that a little bit since we're since we're on the subject. Um, has a cafeteria, has a food storage. Um, the food storage was believed to have food for over a year of supplies. It had a gym, had a pool. They buried a school bus in a bunker system that was only accessible by a uh, by like a trap door, um, you know, to, to hide out. They had uh, they had fuel tanks. They had a water tower, uh, which is a four story water tower that also served as a as a lookout tower. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure it was uh, I'm sure it wasn't the code. I'm sure it was a uh, construction nightmare, but. But, they but did. I mean, and I'm assuming it all came from his brain. So to be able to build a compound from scratch, you know, with your ideas and have it functioning to a point where. Right. Yeah. They lived in it, it for years. Yeah. And uh, and, and they had and, and they had room to grow like they, they weren't like, hey, it's just us. There is uh, apparently room to grow uh, in this compound as well. So how did they sustain themselves? Well, they sustained themselves through tithing, a 10 to 20 percent tithing. Everyone there had had to tithe their income to him. Did they have jobs outside of it? Um, some had jobs outside of it, but some had jobs that were connected to the businesses that they started. They started three main businesses. One was a uh, a sewing business, little little sew shop. I'm sure, it was a kind of little Chinese Nike sew yeah. shop. Um, one was a auto body repair, and last but not least, um, they owned a gun store called the Mag Bag in town. Which, which, because uh, one of the members had an FFL, and that uh, and that business did very well for him. So, enter in, you know, to kind of like every whether it's the whether it's uh, an old civilization, whether it's a cult, whether it's political power, there's always someone coming for your job, mm-hmm. and uh, and the same way, the same way Dave got into power by by sneaking his way in. This guy named Mark Bro um, also s- started believing that he should be the man, mm. and he should be the one to have sex with all the wives. And um, it's fair. He starts this. He starts this coup, and an unsuccessful coup, and he gets kicked out. Now, this is actually a very important part of the story, because, and again, like Ruby Ridge. Where do you where you get your intel from is so important. Mm-hmm. This happened to me as an ODA member uh, overseas when we collect our our own intel, and even even the Delta Force. Validating your intel is everything. And there were a couple missions we almost went on as Green Berets, uh, one in particular, where um, this guy was told us his concrete factory was smuggling uh, weapons through. All, all the concrete trucks leaving the concrete factory. We're about to go in there and wreck shop. And you know what we eventually found out? It was a competition. It was the competition. <laughs> That's awesome. Good so on him. Good we try. Actually, <laughs> we actually went there to talk to the guy uh, to to kind of validate it and said, hey, I just want to let you know we got this intel and we'd like to come look at your facility. And so it basically did a, you know, just walked up there instead of doing the hard knock in the middle of the night and yeah. taking by force we just went and talked to the guy and the guy goes let me guess who told you and gave his com- his, his competitor's name verbatim to us and right away we were like that's what we thought we're still gonna look at your place but yeah we're pretty sure we know what's going on here so some stories never change and that is the story of mark bro mark bro gets kicked out he's not happy about it he's documented as saying he's going to get his revenge and that's exactly what he did boy did he he makes several several um many phone calls to cps saying that there are bad things happening to kids out there sexual assault sexual misconduct underage sex um cps takes takes these things seriously and they made several trips out to uh the compound no charges brought against them. I'm sure they left that place going, this place is weird. Yeah, but not they're, illegal. But, but they're not illegal. And so the CPS did their job, and again, several times, and found nothing illegal. 
it, and that's the same thing as in the cop work too. Is that somebody, a neighbor, they can know. I know they're dealing drugs. I know they are. And every time we go out there, we do our due diligence. And there's just at at at, at that point in time, right then and there, there's nothing that can be done because there's nothing illegal afoot. Yeah, that we can see. Good word, afoot. <laughs> We probably should have done Ruby Ridge first because technically it, it happened before him. Yeah. And, and I'm going to reference it a, a few times. But don't worry. Maybe maybe it'll just entice you to, to watch the Ruby Ridge episode. <laughs> um, enter the ATF because he says he calls the ATF as well and said, hey, he's doing a whole bunch of illegal activities with guns. You really need to look into this guy. Well, the ATF is fresh off of a horrible, disgraceful um, debacle called Ruby Ridge, and the ATF's like, oh yeah, some weirdos with guns? We could use a victory here. Mm-hmm. And they send guys out to go looking. ATF starts asking around local gun shops and around town, and nobody has anything bad to say about the Branch Davidians or their business dealings with them, or no gun shop ever said, oh yeah, we we know they're they're doing illegal things with guns. We've heard about it from our customers. Never happened. Not one. In fact, one gun shop owner who knew David called him while the ATF was there and said, hey, I just want to let you know the ATF is here looking for you, and you might want to talk to him. And David Koresh invites him out and says, oh, yeah, have him come on out. Can I talk to him? The ATF agent doesn't doesn't even take the phone. He says, no, I don't want to talk to him. Uh. Invites the ATF out CPS went out there and looked with their own eyes. ATF, you're out there, you're asking, you want to know. They invite you out. And they're like, nah, we're just going to keep, we're just going to sneaking around until we find what we want. Yeah. Um, They turn it down. So not only, not only do they turn that down, they decide to rent a house across the street from the compound. And I think this is, in, yeah, I'm sure you've, you've heard at least some of the stuff that, you know, that I've talked about, but you're, you're probably caught up to the, yeah. to the story now. Cause now we're kind of starting the, the documentary, the, 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 yeah, the, the siege stuff. and the documentaries. Yeah. This, I mean, it's like the Keystone cops. Um, you know, this from police work. I know this from my recce work. The hardest thing to do is to do surveillance undetected in a rural area. They have, I, I don't know. Well, I'm guessing 77 acres. Uh, still, yeah. When something moves or is out of place, it's a dead giveaway that something's going on, right there. You and and they rent the, pretty much the only house in the area, and it's right across the street. Uh, and the, and uh, and apparently they unload boxes and boxes and boxes of surveillance stuff into into the into the house. That's right across the street from their compound. They know what's happening. Not all, not they know what's happening, and they're not scared of them. Um, or, you know, worried about them. They actually send people to the house with food and an invitation to come to their church service. And the ATF agent uh, opens the door, just cracks it, says the least amount of words he can, he can do and slams the door on them. And so those members go back to the compound and report what happened. And now the compound is starting to get scared. They're like, they're, you know, we've invited them out to our compound they said no. Now they're moving in a team to watch us across the street. We tried to be friendly neighbors. You wouldn't even open the door. I'm sure they took their food. Uh, you won't come to our service. You won't have any interaction with us, and you're cold. This is the beginning of them fearing. This is going to be a problem. This is going to be a problem. Yeah. Yeah, handwriting's on the wall. Unless we can unless we can fix this or, or turn the public perception of us around, this is going to be a problem. So, um, so David actually lines up a news inter- uh, interview because of this. So one of their answers is, "Well, just not enough people know about us. We, we are this kind of hidden entity, and they do fire guns out of their range all the time. They've had complaints about their constant gun firing, and I, I get that. Um, but again, nothing illegal. Yeah. Um, and so he lines up this this uh, this news interview, and you'll hear him. And when you hear him talk. What you will hear from any two-way listener out there is not necessarily a cult leader. When he's talking, he's talking about an avid two-way defender, saying that they have weapons, they're allowed to have weapons. I'm sure you don't, you know, like to hear the gunfire all the time, but you can't just come in here and take our weapons because you're scared of us because you don't know about us. 
you know, he goes on to say, I can't remember the countries he named, but he's like, you know, this isn't Europe, and this isn't Canada. This is our right as American citizens to have guns, and you can't just come take our guns and, and, uh, and be tyrannical rulers and then question us and then, like, make, you know, make us justify why we have to have guns. This is America. I'm allowed to have guns. So he actually gives, but granted, I don't think it's the best PR. Yeah. That I don't think that's what the ATF wanted to hear. Because, you know? Yeah, because no one likes when you tell them, I can do this because I'm an American and the Constitutional says it. It doesn't really sell it to them, mm-hmm. you know? So the ATF continues down this road, and they uh, they send in an undercover agent, and now they have an undercover agent inside the compound. Um, David Koresh, he's, he's a lot of things, and I, I'm not, again, I won't shy away from this. He's a weirdo. Um, he probably is doing unethical things or immoral things, at least in my eyes. Um, doesn't, doesn't warrant what happened to him, uh, but he's a smart guy. He is a smart guy, and this guy comes in. And he immediately tags him as an undercover ATA agent. I was going to say, like, Tag- he, it's his church. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so this guy comes in as a wonder. He's like, oh, I'm interested. I want to shoot guns. want to learn more about religion, this and that. And David Koresh believes him to be an undercover ATF agent. But what does David Koresh do as a smart takes guy? Him takes him in. Not only does he take him, he takes him in and shows him things, shows him everything, takes him shooting. He's like, well, this is my chance to, if you won't come to me openly, I know who you are, and I'll plead my innocence through this undercover agent. So they send uh, an undercover agent in. Um, he befriends him. Well, let's see here. And in 1993, the ATF goes to a judge looking for a search warrant. So they're they're they don't care what the evidence is or what the evidence isn't. They are sure of this. And one of the things they they use for uh, um, as reasons for the search warrant, again, no good deed goes unpunished. There's a picture of all his guns um, in the news conference or the, the news interview that he lines up, and they misidentified some 50 cows as illegal 50 cows that were actually legal 50 cows. Mm. Did they misidentify? misidentify. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know. So, I, you know I, you I'm think a, that I, the ATF would know. <laughs> so not only did they use that as, as evidence— they they used the allegations of the CPS as evidence. Um, mind you, the CPS already did their job and already uh, found them to be innocent. Uh, but ATF, that's not your job. Yep. Well, I don't even know why that why you're bringing that up, ATF. Two thirds of the complaints that they use in the search warrant were all from a single source. You know what that single source is. Uh, what was his name? Mark Bro. Mark, yeah. Mark Bro. Um, it's it's kind of crazy. Uh, I will say this, and and again, this is why I have to watch a, a bunch of different documentaries. Like they, you know, some all all have their, you know, have the the point or the case or or the the way they want to paint, you know, this this scenario. Um, some of them left this out. But one does talk about uh, one of them. One of the complaints that they brought forth was a delivery driver. A delivery driver was delivering a box, and he said the tape broke and some grenade bodies yeah. fell out. And he thought that was very suspicious. And he goes and and tells some people about it. Now they do not to be a spoiler alert. They they do have a lot of training grenades that was found later. Um, I don't believe they found any live grenades. But they did have training grenades. Why they had training grenades? Couldn't are tell. Are they you. illegal? Yeah, but are they illegal? <laughs> no, they're, they're, they're not, not grenades. No, training grenades are not illegal. Weird to have. Not Weird to have. to have. Not illegal. <laughs> now, again, spoiler. We'll go to the end. They had illegal guns. They had manipulated guns to full auto, um, and that was proven after. And that, that was proven after the fact. Uh, but again, that they. They don't know that Mm -hmm. at this time. And, you know, not to... The end doesn't justify the means. And this is a classic reason. This is a classic reason. That's like when your girl goes through your phone and then finds something, but she had no reason to go through your phone. And she's like, but I found something. I was trying to relate to the cops out there. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely a relatable story. Uh, I would say more like, I mean, you know, take it to, you know, take it to a traffic stop. Just... Can yep. you search a car 
with no reason to search it and then find something during that search and have that hold up in court. Nope. And I because the end ju- does not justify the means. You know, there there has been times where I've been on traffic stops where it was found and then somebody was like, oh, also, I found this, too. It's like, well, did you did you find that before you stopped the car? Because because well, mm. sometimes when you get something good and you're like all of a sudden like the, the probable cause for the stop is kind of like, uh, can you get something more solid? And they're like, oh, hold on. Give me five minutes. And it's like, uh. yeah. So, <laughs> e- so even at the uh, at that level of police work. That this this would not this would not fly. Um, by the way, one one of the things they also brought as to to bolster their case was reports of a of a meth lab being mm-hmm. uh, being on uh, on their grounds, which is true. However, and you'd have to tell me, and I don't know the the truth about you know the, some of these things uh, I talk about because I'm not law enforcement. It has it one well, one that was true. But David Koresh had already kicked that guy out and was the reason he was arrested. But they didn't tell the judge that. They just said, they just cherry picked these reports and said there's reports of a meth lab there, which were true. Those reports were out there, and David Koresh already corrected this problem. But is it true that there is a length of of intel has to be information has to be relevant within six months, or or it it passes the 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 length of time they can use within a, a warrant uh, a search yeah every brand every level is different at the federal level probably not i mean so and again i don't know i can't only one documentary said this but it said uh you know they have a six month lifespan on 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 reporting to go off of and this would have exceeded that mm. regardless it doesn't matter because it was a half truth reporting that because he'd already been arrested and taken off the facility ironically enough by david Gresh. So that is the the judge grants a knock warrant. Try not to laugh about that if you know what the what the ATF eventually does to this compound. They were granted a knock warrant. Yeah, that's the same as you seeing me with drugs. Going like, "Hey, police, Tyler's got drugs. I'm arrested for drugs out, you know." outside in the parking lot and then them coming in and writing a search warrant and finding a little bit where the drugs were I was like no that's the drugs that Tyler had well I don't well when I say knock warrant I, I don't know apparently the ATF views a knock warrant as a hundred man assault force sieging a compound uh, th- what they ended up doing was the furthest thing from a knock warrant anyway uh, according to reports they knew that and they were just going to ask for forgiveness later that's how bad they wanted this mm. um Mind you, David Koresh goes on a jog almost daily, and he jogs on his jogging path is right in front of the surveillance house that the ATF has. He also works uh, at the at the mag bag, makes trips in, into town all the time. If you wanted David Koresh, one cop car could have got David Koresh any time you wanted him. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't, I don't understand their, you know, their. The maybe they wanted, the maybe they wanted him to be with the firearms for a stronger case that they right. already said they don't have enough strength right. for. In and they had an undercover agent, you know, you know, on uh, inside with, and they had they would have other undercover agents come out and shoot with with uh, with David Koresh. Um, and I just. And David Koresh had already invited them out. So there's just, to me, I mean, and I, as I was, I, I'm usually sympathetic. I say, hey, hindsight's always twenty twenty, and it's hard, you know, it's easy to armchair quarterback this. But this one is hard to understand why with all that on the table, knock warrant, he runs, you know, undercover agents down, the, you know, are, are in there, yet you're using intel from, from old meth lab reports, you're using intel from uh, a disgruntled member of this and CPS reports that have already found to uh, come up, you know, unfruitful. I just, I don't understand why you believe all this. Now, get the boys together. We're going to go train up in Fort Hood for three days and we're going to do a daylight assault. Bring, bring everyone. How long? And it's only, I say this, but it's only, what, like, 10 years after? No, maybe 20 years when it happened. But 
I mean, like, look at the amount of preparation and intelligence uh, verification went through to find and assault the most wanted man in the world. All that, that time that, okay, we know it's him. How long before they actually executed that, you know, as opposed yeah, to months the, and months and months. The months ATS, months. like, now we got to do it now. Got to do it now. <laughs> I don't know if this is true. Please, all you guys that uh, are smarter than me, and and uh, we'll we'll put it down in the comments. Um, I don't know if this is true, but I'll go off on some of these conspiracy theories. So I'll I'll, inter- I'll entertain some people on this. Some people say they were hungry for uh, a win after after Ruby Ridge, and they wanted one. They wanted one right now. They thought this was it, and they were gonna and they were gonna make this their victory, and they wanted one quick. I don't. I don't think that's a. I don't think that's a crazy conspiracy. No, it's, um, it sounds political. It sounds the, like the it, other one. Oh, go ahead. It just sounds like the ATF, like you're saying, is like we need to look good. But I've seen that at the local level. You know, like, all right, well, this house is a problem house. No, it's got a couple of turds that smoke weed in the driveway, and we'll waste tens of thousands <laughs> of dollars in resources right. because they that house in particular happens to be living in the neighborhood of a council member. Right. And so it's just, I mean, it's not yeah. the same by any means, but it's still it's similar. Politically it's similar, driven. right? Yeah. Um, another person said, or yeah, another uh, article. I mean, I went everywhere for information. You know, I, I mean, I, again, I, you have to be careful where you go for information. But you, but you look at it all. You know, and you, this is the whole body of work, and you kind of decide what you think is was right or not. Um, talked about, you know, the the ATF was on the chopping block and 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 was and needed after Ruby Ridge and needed funding and needed more funding and this was a way for them. I know it's similar, but instead of politically driven, it it was driven uh, driven funding wise mm-hmm. to prove you need us and we need a bigger budget because there's bad guys like this. Um, and then when you go into the uh, the belly of the internet beast into the fringe right wing uh, people, they'll say it was basically two way driven. Bill Clinton is now in charge. The Democrats are very, you know, anti two way and they are going to send a message to, to gun owners and, you know, and to gun owners that have large stashes and would dare, um, dare, uh, expand on and or threaten you know more the 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 more their policies of less guns and they're going to go after those people and so again politically driven but politically driven in a different way where it's anti-2a on the clinton administration magnet has a question or comment and he did the 10-year assault weapon ban in 94 which was just a year later yeah i i i painted that probably on Un, unfairly saying that it was a fringe right wing thing, um, but I, I say that because that's where I got the most of that information from of people giving that that uh, that that argument, and it's probably and the answer is probably D. They're all true. Yeah, you know, you know, <laughs> all why, the above. Why, yeah, all the above. <laughs> why, why pick one? All right. So the ATF goes to Fort Hood, and for three days they train up on this mission. Uh, now. They uh, it uh, it was called Operation Trojan Horse, which shows you the mentality of what they know they needed. They needed speed, surprise, and violence of action, and to not be noticed. Mainly surprise, there. yeah, surprise. Trojan Horse. They needed that surprise. It was a big flat land. Um, it had a, it had a lookout tower. It would it is very hard to get a large a large assault force and and into uh, into that environment. Yeah, you'd see them coming a mile away. Mm-hmm. Their intel showed that they were working on a uh, a storm shelter, and most of the men, we'll call it founder of life, most of the men were every day were working on that storm shelter. So their plan was to come in on cattle trucks, which, to be honest, with you, is actually a pretty good plan. Yeah, you know, and don't get me wrong, I mean it's going to be weird that you know these cattle trucks are are coming up the driveway, but it doesn't exactly scream assaulters. You know what I mean? So it's a lot better than Bearcats. I know that Bearcats back then, but uh, what they have? They have was it Bradleys they used at first? Oh, uh, well, yeah. We'll get into the arsenal yeah. that uh, that they bring to bear when 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 the uh, when the cattle truck raid doesn't work out. But their their plan was to bring cattle trucks uh, in early morning when they thought most of the men would be outside the compound and it briefed as as an easy day. They thought they'd be in and out in a couple hours. 
So I would also I also believe in their arrogance and in their need to have a public victory, they tell the media the day that the raid is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And they want the media to see this and they want the media to see, you know, this this weird cult getting taken down and all these illegal firearms brought out and them being the good guys. Everybody coming out in handcuffs. Well, as fate would have it, that's that's one of their downfalls was inviting the media to it because one of the media trucks gets lost uh, and stops a postal uh, a mailman and says, hey, do you know where the Vidin Branch compound is? Because there's an ATF raid happening today and we're, well, he doesn't say that. He just goes, hey, do you know where the Vidin Branch compound is? He goes, sure, and gives him directions. He goes, by chance, well, why do you want to know? He asks him and the reporter tells the truth. He goes, yeah, there's a large ATF raid happening on it today and we're here to cover it. Oh. You know who that guy happened to be? Uh, one of the Branch Davidians, right? David Koresh's uh, brother-in-law. <laughs> So David Koresh's brother-in-law, who is the mailman, hauls ass back to the compound and tells everyone, get ready, they're coming. So the guys who are getting ready to go work on the uh, on the shelter don't go work on the, on the storm shelter. And as fate would have it, the undercover agent was talking to David Koresh when, you know, oh, when, cool. when, when this, when this happened, when, when the mailman, the brother-in-law comes in and says, they're coming for me. And he turns to the un the undercover agent, which is still undercover, and says, "They're coming for me, aren't they?" He makes up he, in his own testimony, he gets so nervous. He's he makes up a bad excuse. He says, "Oh, hey, I got a I got a breakfast meeting I forgot about," and he goes out to his car, and his hand is shaking so bad he has to use his left hand to to steady his hand to unlock his car. To, to leave um that's that's how smooth that's how smooth these guys are yeah um he look at the time <laughs> yeah yeah look at the time gotta go um um you might get into this uh, if if i'm going too far into it let me know but he david has been telling these people that the holy war is going to be with the federal government right has he been prepping them like or I, I I didn't come across you know that and this and this is why I, I do love it when you know we both do research there's so much information you know uh, out there on that you know if if you know if I miss something or is that something you, you came across yeah it, as a right winger I don't you know calling just, him one yeah you know, I don't uh, as an extreme two way guy it kind of lines up I mean because logically to him. logically I would think like if I was a follower I'd be like why is the Holy War going to have anything to do with the federal government? But these people also were convinced to tear down their homes and build a giant compound and give their wives to him. So, right. They're, uh, they're malleable. <laughs> they're malleable. I guess gullible would probably be the yeah. better, a better word. It's probably trying to be nice about it, but no, no need to be nice about that. That's just gullible. So he comes in, tells them ATF agent takes off the ATH, the ATF agent, the undercover ATF agent, goes right to the surveillance house and says, I also find this to be a little bit ironic. You have an undercover agent in the house the morning that you're going to take it down. He clearly doesn't know. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you pull out your undercover agent? Oof. How does he not know about this? <laughs> that's to me. That's that's crazy to me. What was because the undercover name? He doesn't. What was his name? Uh, I, I didn't write it down. It, it's it's it, it's out there. Somebody just, was supposed to tell him, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who do we task that to? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're in their cattle trucks. Did anyone tell Brad we were coming? <laughs> so he, I, I find that to be uh, to be odd. But this is the beginning of a lot of, just to be honest, a lot of bush league things that yeah. they were, you know, that they had done and are doing. They're just unprofessional, um, and. Uh, so he goes to the to the surveillance house and he goes, "Call off the raid. They know, they know we're coming. Yeah, call off the raid." And they absolutely, absolutely, positively should have called off that raid. In law enforcement, I can tell you, unless there's a hostage situation, any raid would be called off if there was intelligence that they knew you were coming. Is in a direct action military would that would that constitute you guys uh, and, canceling it? So. I say this, and and I, I can tell you stories where where we went when they they knew we were coming. And the first time that happened to me, we paid the price on it, and I buried a good friend of mine. 
Those are two different scenarios, and I'll tell you why. When a high-value target is involved, whether they know you're coming or not, and you now know this is where he is and he moves all the time and you don't get another shot at him, I understand that. I don't understand this. Mm -hmm. You can call this off. They're not moving. They're in a compound. You know where he's been at for months. You know where he's been at for years. He goes outside all the time. You could so easily have called off this raid and been like, "Hey, we, you know, we let's let's rethink this." They absolutely should have, and they didn't. And I don't. Um, I'm gonna go out on a limb. It's my opinion, but it's it continues down there. How bad they want this win and a little bit of their arrogance, mm-hmm. like this. So the raid continues. The raid goes off. Um, just. Uh, they, they, the, the assaulters yeah, even note this when they went through in cattle trucks and they, they saw the storm shelter, they did their due diligence. They know, you know, what the, you know, what the Intel is and what they should be saying. And they all remember seeing, having a bad feeling when there were no males outside working when they were supposed to be working. Oh, I didn't even think about that. They knew that. And so that's when this is, begins to not feel right. Mm-hmm. Um, Sitting with no cover in a cattle truck. Oh, man. Just concealment. (laughs) How many guns they have? (laughs) So they unasked the cattle trucks. um, And I, I kind of get it, but I, but I, I, but I I don't, Um, I've, people are going to yell at me for this, but it's just true. I've shot dogs on target, you know, and again, it goes back to Ruby Ridge. There was a dog, a a dog getting shot that, uh, that, that, kind of started the whole thing mm-hmm. well ironically enough a dog getting shot kicks off everything going awry um in my opinion there's a this is where you get a lot of different views uh, it's just chaos. this this first couple hours of the siege is just absolute chaos so one story is well it's not a story they shot the dog they shot the dog they had one dog with four puppies i don't know if they shot the puppies um but they definitely shot the dog coming in and the, sh- the shooting of that dog is may have been what what uh, triggered the Branch Davidians to start firing back in self-defense. In all of the, the, the no, they did it, no, they did it, no, they did it. The first one was who even fired the first shot. That's like, it's, it's based off of opinion almost. Right. And so... The ATF swears up and down that they didn't shoot, that nobody shot first, you know, on their side, uh, that the, the, the people who shot were the, uh, that they were acting in self-defense because the tyrants inside the compound shot at, shot at them. Um, and we'll probably never know uh, the truth on that. But I believe, very much believe, that if that didn't kick it off, it definitely heightened everything going on because everything you're scared of is now coming to fruition. The feds are coming after you. They're killing your dogs. Shots are now have now rung out, and everybody's on edge. Yeah, and what I also learned was that these people really, really did fear law enforcement as uh, an opposition and an invasive force. They didn't understand the concept even of oppressive government coming to take our guns. They, From what I gathered, these people with the followers really did think that they were going to come in and kill everybody. And I'll I'll kind of um, get nitpicky with this. I believe they thought that with the feds, both local law enforcement. I I don't believe that's the case, and I'll tell you why. Uh, David Kresh made several phone calls to the to the local sheriff. Mm-hmm. He's like, I want to talk to the sheriff. While this was happening, or before? Well, yeah. during the during this during the fifty one day siege, oh, yeah, he yeah. reached out and talked to the sheriff. So I believe. Don't get me wrong. I don't believe he had full trust in, in in law enforcement in general, but I believe they had at least enough trust and you know, and at least yeah. a working relationship, we'll call it, with local law enforcement. Um, but I, but the feds, I don't think they trusted the feds at all. And mind you, again, I don't even trust the feds. We say it all. Yeah, I've, this is probably the third time I've said it. Ruby Ridge that happened just six months ago, and this has got to be fresh on 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 their minds yeah. as well. Um, so here's the other. Here's the other. Bush League thing that happens and may have kicked it off. I don't know. Uh, one of the ATF officers shoots himself in the leg climbing a ladder. Ooh, see, they leave some of the stuff out of the uh, documentaries. Now, and I can tell you uh, from experience, we have fired uh, guys from OTC. You know, when you're when you're fresh doing a lot of ladders, and we. <laughs> for, uh, well, I won't say that. We, we we just use ladders. We'll just say that. 
I won't get too specific. <laughs> um, Beep. <laughs> yeah. That that is a that is a tough time. You could absolutely um, discharge your weapon on a ladder. I tell you how. And I'll tell you how it happens. One, not having your finger inside the trigger well, like all firearm safety, is the biggest thing. Because once you start grabbing rungs on a ladder, you start doing this. You start grabbing, and you normally do mm. this, and it's and it's just it's too easy to discharge a weapon on a ladder. ATF agent shoots himself in the leg. Now, if you're on a ladder shooting yourself, in the leg, it means you're right up against the compound. Like you're that that gunfire that comes out happens right on the side of that wall. There's um, again. I don't know exactly who shot first, but we all know uh, a massive amount of fire happens. Um, David Koresh, actually, as this is kind of starting, he runs outside unarmed, waving his hands in the air, um, yelling, stop, don't do this. There's women and children inside. Don't shoot. Like, that shows, yeah, as an assaulter, like that... When I see that, you're always profiling people, engaging, you know, how people are, are acting, how they act towards you, uh, demeanor. That's not the, you know, that's not the demeanor of some crazed, I'm going, I'm, I'm going down in a, in a, uh, you know, in a, in a hail of, of gunfire. Like, he's trying to protect his people. He's unarmed. Could you, could you see it as how people would maybe say that he's hiding behind women and children? Well, I couldn't say he's hiding behind women and children because he's out in the front. Everyone else is inside the, everyone else is inside the compound. Not literally, but, but yeah, like, figuratively, he's using women and children as don't, don't, you can't do oh, this. Oh, you, using like the subject of women yeah. and children hiding behind it. Um, probably, yeah, and well, and I and I believe rightfully so. And it's you know? also been there's rightfully been no so. there's been no intelligence that any of these people are being held against their will. So that's another um, big thing. I'm glad you mentioned that. That, that that's in my notes because after this, we'll we'll get to it. Okay. You're absolutely right. This is not a hostage rescue uh, situation, and never was, um, and is not going to be when the you know as the siege uh, unfolds. So David Koresh comes out unarmed, yelling, "Don't shoot!" There's women and children inside, and he gets shot, and and his father-in-law, which is behind him, gets shot and killed. So there's a barrage of bullets coming his way, and I have to. I have he's to. He's clearly assume, unarmed, and he's clearly unarmed. And this isn't the first time they um, they shoot unarmed people, uh, and we'll get into more of that as uh, chronologically. So the chaos ensues. There's an exchange of gunfire. There's also helicopters with snipers uh, on it. They shoot an unarmed man who was cleaning uh, the water tower as his job. They shoot him and kill him unarmed um they're just and they're indiscriminately firing into the house i have a problem with that and i get it like when you're taking fire you know this but this isn't combat you know what i mean like in in one aspect you know if you're patrolling and from a wood line to the right you start taking you know a hail of fire you may return fire indiscriminately to return fire and try to you know at least uh, not putting that on paper. Oh uh, no! Well, th well, no, that, that's not true. I mean, as a seven eight tactic, you're supposed to do that. Oh, you meant on a on a patrol? Yeah, on a, a patrol. I'm talking patrol. about on a on a military oh, gotcha. patrol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I there's get been that. guys that got hemmed up. You, oh, <laughs> in this situation, they know the amount of women and children in there. They know how flimsy and you know and built by by wood this structure is. They even mention it. And that it looks you, like it was built by two by fours and plywood. That's right. And they're just indiscriminately firing into this compound. I I have a problem with that. You know, and it's funny too. I think that I mean, this is just my opinion, and it's probably not proven anywhere. But in that generation of agents, so tactical agents at that, you know, whatever they were, I don't know what ATS tactical team was called, but those guys were probably maybe some Vietnam veterans that, you know, you ever seen? Uh, you, that's remember, true. remember, right, yeah, remember yeah. in Die Hard. Where yeah. he's in the chopper and he's like, "Oh, this reminds me of Saigon," and he oh. just goes nuts and starts shooting. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good point. You know, they they may have those type of you know um, those those training scars, if you will, yeah. or actual battle scars from from returning fire. But at the end of the day, you have to change gears. Mm -hmm. You're now a law enforcement, a federal law enforcement officer, and you can't just shoot wildly into a building with women and children. Um, another 
uh, Bush League move on their part was a lot of the guns they were there to find that day were gone at a gun show. Ooh. How do you not know that? How do you not know they didn't you know, They didn't load up guns and take them to a gun show? You would have think that and, would be the intel and, that undercover agent might have gotten. <laughs> the undercover agent, the surveillance you know, observation post, uh, uh, open source intelligence. Uh, there's a lot of things that they should have known that was uh, the case. So that's just another... This is another indicator that this was just poorly executed in, 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 in every in every sense. Um, here's another just big problem I have. Speaking of the uh, the gun store, Mike Schroeder was working at the mag bag. His wife and kids are are at the compound. He catches wind that that there is a siege happening and his wife and family is there. What would any husband do? He gets in his car. He drives there, he parks, and he, 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 I don't, he parks, apparently it seems like he doesn't go through the, you know, the, the line of feds. He parks, he knows the lay of the land. He parks somewhere and he tries to run into the, the building to, to, uh, to unite with his wife and kids and see if they're still alive. He gets shot in the back seven times on his way, trying, trying to make it to the house. Unarmed, shot seven times. It's cr- that's that's crazy to me. Yeah. Um, and his dead body, uh, his dead body laid there um, for seven days, and they only moved it once they once they found out that wild dogs were eating his dead body, and they decided to go move his dead body. Again, it just goes into you know the the whole storyline of of who these of, of who the feds were. Yeah, at, at yeah. the time. I'm not saying it's how all feds are and who they are now, but I'm t- telling you what they're capable of. Mm-hmm. It's just like, um, what do you call that? Like, gas, I mean, this is a shitty pun, but, you know, throwing gasoline on a fire. Like, you're already there doing what you're doing, and then you got to just rub it in by leaving a guy you just shot oh, there's, unlawfully dead right. there in front of everybody. And there's reports. It's not, well, I won't say reports as if on. There's, I've heard the 911, you know, phone or the not 911, the the phone calls with the negotiators where they're calling and said, hey, can you have your agents out on the perimeter stop mooning us and flicking the bird at us? How unprofessional is that? Like that is that. Don't get me wrong, I get it. They lost, they lost men there too, and and I get that. But you are law enforcement. Yep. You are the federal higher government. Standard. You're that's right. You're you're put to a higher standard. Um. The initial gun battle was two hours long, and during this two hours, there were several 911 phone calls from the, the compound begging them for a, you know, that was their way of communicating because they hadn't talked to negotiators yet, begging them for a ceasefire, saying there's women and children here, you're killing women and children, please, please stop shooting, please stop shooting, please stop shooting. They only agreed to a ceasefire two hours later. Some reports said they were out of ammo. That the feds were out of ammo, and that's why you know, they agreed to the ceasefire. I heard, I heard that they the ceasefire was because they had a wounded ATF agent that was bleeding out, and he was able to communicate with the guys that were trying to get to him. You know, so they were like, "Hey, can we go? Can we wave white flags and let us go pick this guy up?" I'd, you know what? And, and even if that's true, uh, and, and to be honest with you, I, I hope that's true. That's a much better story than, you know, it's more real. Yeah, you know, it is a much better story than they they yeah, only I decided am. to give you know, they were out of ammo. Um, but either way, game on either way. That's right. <laughs> they, either way, at the end of the day, they only agreed to a ceasefire when it was advantageous. Yeah. You know, yeah, for this for them and not for the women and the children inside the compound. Um, And. Hey, b- by the end of this, there were, and just to give you the numbers and to tell you how deadly this was, over 80 Branch Davidians died. Not not right now, but I, I don't know what the numbers were on the between the invasion and what uh, happened at the end, which we'll tell you. But we're talking about over 80 Branch Davidians died, 25 children and two pregnant wives died during this ordeal. So, yeah, I got to, and don't get me wrong, I'm the first one to tell you, hey, um, that wouldn't have happened to that guy if he would have mm-hmm. if he would have complied. I'm I'm a big fan yeah, we're of compliance. That. We're at we're dealing with this issue and how because yeah. it's obviously they're not going to comply and you should treat it as if as a law enforcement 
entity, even though you can't prove and there's no indication why, you should always think that those people right. can't, are going to be subject to whatever is going to happen. But I'm also a big fan because I'm, I'm fair. I feel like I'm fair with law enforcement. If a law enforcement officer is being um, is treating a suspect correctly and he's just not complying, that's all on the suspect. But when the law enforcement officer is the one escalating the situation, when it was, it was he was just stopped for speeding. You know, you're trying, you're you know, treating him like he's a, a you know, a, a wanted murderer. You know, you escalated the situation, and yes, he should have complied. But you know, you're you're at fault for being in this situation. Mm -hmm. That falls to this. You'd have never been in the situation, in the situation, asking or needing compliance from them if you didn't wildly escalate it from the start. Um, again. Goes on for for two hours. Um, I've, I do have the numbers here. Four T ATF agents died in uh, in the initial siege. Twenty injured, and six Branch Davidians are are dead. So they had to wait. Two were two uh, agents were dead on the roof. That they had to wait until the siege was over in order to not the siege. Sorry, the uh, initial gunfight was over in order to. And I don't know if that them. I don't know if that was during the white flag. You know. Um, ceasefire where they were able to do it but they yeah. during the whole time they couldn't get him because it logistically was impossible to get those bodies off the roof. Yeah. And again, I'll, I'll say this one more time about, about compliance. At the end of the day this is not how I would have handled it if uh, if I was the leader of this group. They would have they would have came in heavy handed and we would have already been on the ground with our hands behind our back laying on the ground and you already invited them in yeah. now, now they're coming. You know, It's not the way you wanted it to happen. So again, I don't want anyone to misconstrue this as if me and I—I I know you, and, and, or me or you are saying this is justified. Absolutely not justified, but we're, but this is what's happening. Um. So now, the, now you know the uh, you know the feds and and all the, and everyone else besides just the HRT are 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 coming in, and it's treated like a hostage rescue. Uh, you know. Um, mission with the with their rules of engagement and their negotiators and, and and the way they're looking at it but the truth is it's not a hostage rescue mission not one person is there against their will david koresh on several uh on, at, on, at several times several instances says hey if anyone wants to leave inside here you are free to leave and some people took him up on that and i'll we'll go over those numbers and tell you when it happens but we're this is not a hostage rescue situation um, over the 51 day standoff, 754 calls were made to and from, uh, the, the, uh, negotiators. You will find out if you guys, you know, look further into this, there is a massive disconnect between the negotiators and what the feds on the ground are doing. Yes. The, the, the negotiators have, have come out and said publicly, I believe we could have saved 20 to 30 more people mm -hmm. if it wasn't for your antics. Yeah. The guys it was the, the tactical versus the, uh, versus the. What do you call? What was a good word for it? tactical versus the operational? Yeah, it was. It was essentially aspect. it was negotiators versus HRT, and it, they weren't. They weren't communicating. They were not on the same page. And uh, and the 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 agent, the special agent in charge, or the director, or whoever was in charge of the whole thing, with everybody underneath him, at the end of the, and I know I'm jumping forward, but he was pressed for time and money, and people were like, "Let's get this done." And of course, your direct action or your hostage rescue is going to be the quickest way to fix something. Which is crazy to me because time and money is something the government has. <laughs> it's so true. You know? I, I just, you know um, they uh, take 25% of mine, so. Right. R really, I, and I would, you, you, but you're right. I mean, time and money, but but I would probably say more or less this is now a, a massive, it's just, this, this turned into what was supposed to be a massive success is now another massive failure. And yeah. every day it goes by. They just and wanted, I think they just want it to be over. I with. think it's also too when you're like talking to your kid and you're like one, two, two and a half, and you're oh, like, yeah. holy shit, am I gonna have to get to three? And what's gonna happen? So you're like two and three quarters, and then you're like, well, now I have to be I have to be strong at three and spank my toddler. It's it's funny you say that because that's that's you know that's exactly what happened. Um, we'll go over you know uh, just some of the things that that happened during this uh, 51 day siege. Um, they were believed to have, uh, I kind of talked about earlier, a year's worth of food and, and water, uh, stored up. So there is a part of them that's like, this isn't your normal type of, we can just, 
we we can just hang around and and wait them out, and they will come out. Mm-hmm. They were going to be there for kind of as long as they wanted to be yeah. there, and so I do get that aspect of it. This isn't your normal situation where you wait them out. Um, however, their water tower was damaged on the initial volley of fire. Had a bunch of holes in it. It was leaking water, and they were seen harvesting rainwater off off their roofs. Um, so, which also goes to show them they were they were ready to be there for for the long haul too. So they did have to make a decision at some point. And again, at this point, there is no good and right decision. That right decision should have been done long before this. Now they've made their bed. Um, the David made a deal to release two kids every time that uh, his pre-recorded message was played on the radio station. A total of 16 kids were released that way and two elderly women. Um, and you can see during this ordeal, they desperately were trying to get their message out uh, to the press. They even hung a, 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 um, a, a white sheet out of a window talking about you know, how they want, they want to talk to the press and they want the press to, to hear their, their side of the story. Um, FBI starts using tanks and destroying cars and buildings. Yeah, that's another thing, too. And they didn't tell or have any rhyme or reason why. So when they're calling the negotiators and saying, like, hey, they're running over our cars to be dicks. And negotiators have no idea that they're doing it or why they're doing it. And it's just it's just showing that we have tanks out here. You know what's crazy? You can hear the negotiators in these phone calls try to make excuses for them because mm-hmm. they're clearly on different sheets of music. And he's like... Well, you kind of you know how it is, you know, with, with these kids are in tanks. It's part of their first time in a tank. It's their first time being able to, you know, run something over and do something. So they're just, you know, you, just, you know, kids are being kids, you know, talking about the guys in tanks. Um, the, the negotiator was doing the best they could to try to cover for absolute shenanigans also, that, was, that was going also, on. Also, I don't think the negotiators knew that they were going to play the uh, blast the music and the sounds. Uh which I was watching an interview with one of the negotiations negotiators, and he said, "You know, it is a pr- it's proven that this does nothing but make it worse. In every situation that we've tried to blast music, it just agitates them, and there's no more communication." I hate to bring it up again. They should have known that from Ruby Ridge that uh, that was a massive mistake on on their. They on, did it on, on Ruby Ridge. Part. Oh yeah, and it was heartbreaking how they did it on Ruby Ridge. Again, little 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 teaser yeah, there. We'll go back to that. Um, and they, uh, one of the concessions was the, the guy that died on, on the water tower, unarmed, they were able to bury him in the front yard, was a concession that, that was made. The tanks were rolling over the grave constantly as well, pissing off everyone inside. Um, just they, the guys in the tanks and the guys in the perimeter did not help the situation. And over and over, as we, as we mentioned, the negotiators were just not in sync with with it. the whole process was not a well oiled machine and in sync and communication uh, going up and down the lines. Um, FBI starts using tanks. We talked about that. Uh, there's some more releases with some small concessions. Twelve more leave when David asks if anyone wants to leave. We talked. We you know we, we mentioned that this happens at this point. He goes, hey. You know, it's 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 been a week. Is, is anyone rethinking what they want to do? And, and twelve people say, "Yeah, we're not we're we're not as committed as you are." We're yeah. out, and he lets them out. They all get arrested uh, immediately. Another thing, in front of everybody that they're trying to get out, they took them in jumpsuits. And I, this is what I said. I or not hurt said I read that it was literally orange jumpsuits and handcuffs in front of the people that were watching out the windows that they're trying to convince to come out. Just uh, and <laughs> it's like you I, can't drive them down the road, <laughs> right? You can't. Like they, they couldn't have just fumbled this. Yeah, like, and, and, and every and, and, and every step they just they fumble it over and over again. Um, and like you already said, at this point they start the psyop campaigns with loud noises and lights uh, all night. Uh, a few more get released on their own will, and they get arrested. Here's something that just kind of makes me chuckle a little bit. Uh, over this over the period of this, two people sneak in. Just religious zealots. They're watching on TV. They're like, man, I really feel for these people. They sneak in. Two different people over over the course of this sneak right by the the fed lines, knock on the door, and 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 come in to the uh, come in the compound. Like, you want to talk about porous 
containment. Mm. Like, how does that? How does that happen? Somebody was complacent. Oh man, um, they uh, they end up in in a, in a move kind of you know, uh, looking for more time. They're like, hey, uh, wait, you know, Passover is coming. Um, I think it's like a week long, which is a long time. Maybe it was five days. But like, hey, Passover is coming. Let us. Let us uh, acknowledge Passover, and when Passover is done, then we'll all come out. So there seems to be a uh, an end to the siege uh, at some point. Passover comes and goes, but because of some of these antics and antagonistic uh, uh, and, uh, tactics that they were using, they claim that that's why they didn't come out when they said they were because they didn't because they were continuing to to the to be the aggressor. They weren't holding up their end of the negotiations. Um, you know, we talked about the the, the, the tanks rolling over graves and people flipping uh, people off and mooning people. And this at this point, the government's like, "Hey," uh, and it's actually at the very top. Janet Reno goes, "Hey, this it's." It's time in in this, and they they give her their CS plan. This is what we're gonna do. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna CS the whole building and get and get people out. Janet Reno uh, approves us personally at that level. Um, I'll be interested to take your you know be interested in your take on this. Ironically enough, CS is now um, taken off the like right before this happens. The government says we won't use CS in combat anymore. It's a chemical weapon. In, oh, on in Conus and on state side. No, or, at least militarily. Oh, wow. But Janet Reno, at the same time, says, "Well, but we'll, we'll use it on our on our own citizens." It's poisonous. It's 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 chemical warfare. At the end of the day, Inhumane it's a chemical whatever, yeah. and it's chemical warfare. Okay. And so we we decided to say we're we're not going to use CS, um, but they're going to use it against their 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 own people mm. now. So they start ripping holes. They they use tanks with these long arms, and they start ripping holes in walls to create you know space and, and entry points for for this CS. Now, now it, that that is different. That is different than entering CS through windows and then using a tank to push open the front of the house so you can effectively because that's what they said. They said we we weren't able to get the bunker, so we need to push the front door and the frame and the front of the house in with tanks. In order to effectively do that. And again, that takes away from the less lethal, like, because they were saying, hey, they were saying, I watched this clip. They were like, this is not an assault. This is, we are gassing your building. Do not fire upon us as they're pushing in. This is not an assault. And they're pushing in the front of the building. Sure, it feels like an assault. (laughs) I'm sure that's. uh, You promise? (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and we've seen how good their word is so far. (laughs) Um, So they start pushing it in. So. This CS comes in canisters, and it comes in, uh, in in a powdered form, and they have to mix, and they have to mix it. I'm not a CS expert. Someone uh, will, will will let us know. I, I tried to look down this. I just couldn't find enough. Sure I didn't have enough time and and and, uh, and go down this road far enough. I don't know if it's normal, but they diluted it with paint thinner. They did? That's what they diluted it with. And I'm, sure, I'm sure somewhere in the books it's an acceptable mixing agent. Here's the problem with paint thinner. Paint thinner is highly flammable. flammable. <laughs> highly flammable. <laughs> so that's that's what they used um, to to mix the uh, the CS with. Um, CS, uh, the, you know, tanks continue to, to crush the structure. Now, I don't know if it happened now or later on when the tanks continue to, to crush the structure. There were many bodies found with crushed by tank treads. They killed people. With tanks, Are now sure I don't didn't? believe I don't believe they knew that. I don't believe they they willingly say hey, we're going to go, you know, run the and, and one place where I know it happened was the gymnasium. So when they were tearing down the walls and running tanks into those walls, there were there were kids and uh, adults asleep and ran and ran them over with tanks. Oh god! So bad that. that one tank became, um, one tank became immobilized by a by a human bone caught up in the tank tread and they had to tow it out are you serious yeah yeah it's it's just bad um so the fb here's where it gets crazy so the fbi now they will say that the that the uh branch of had molotov cocktails 
And I believe they did. Whether they used them or not, I, I don't know. But I do know this. The feds threw in incendiary, incendiary, incendiary grenades. <laughs> you just added two more syllables. <laughs> oh, yeah. Can we, can we edit that out? I should. How do you say it? Incendiary. Incendiary. Incendiary, incendiary yeah. grenades. The fed, and I know that to be a fact because when it was all done and being burned down, they, those metal, those metal bodies, you know, survived the flame and you could see them. We know for a fact they added a fire starting propellant, Mm -hmm. you know, into this situation. So, of course, paint thinner, you threw incendiary grenades in there. It goes up like a, you know, like, a ball of a ball of flames as you can see that thing doesn't there's also there's also videos of, of guys on this tank shooting into the compound as they're on top of these tanks are they returning fire through self-defense that i don't know but they're shooting inside the building while they're throwing these 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 grenades in are we too are we at the point of talking about the fire starting and we still got some more to go well, that's that's I mean that's that is the fire starting, you know. On the on the opposite side, uh, I guess HRT snipers were saying, or maybe it was a, somebody with a vantage point was saying they watched uh, three locations ignite randomly against the wind or against the wind where it wouldn't make sense where the wind was pushing it and they were fire, okay. you know. So well, to talk about a perfect storm here, you have. You know, you the, the chemical accelerant that you put in there, and then of course, what's needed to cause it to start fire, the incendiary grenades, and then you opened up all these holes, and it was a windy day. And it was built with two-by-fours and plywood. And built like two-by-fours. <laughs> it was, with those with those combinations, it was meant to be a, it was, it was going to be a, a fireball, which yeah. is what it ended up being. I will say this as a, you know, as an asterisk, it's well known that 20 to 30 people came out of one side of the building after the fire started, but only eight of those people survived. And you can watch news interviews of, of a happening of, of the news reporters going, you know, during the same time frame, is, this, is that gunshots going off? They were shot down. They were executed. Again, weather is in self-defense, but I, n- I never saw anyone say, hey, yeah, those 20, 30 people came out. Yeah, we had to shoot back at them out of self-defense. I never saw someone talk about that. Mm, I haven't heard but that. But a group of 20 to 30 people come out of the backside, and they were gunned down. I don't know why, but I know they were. Only eight people survived. Um, firefighters showed up to the scene. The local firefighters showed up to the scene because there's a f- building on fire. They were not permitted to, to go there to fight the fire. I just find that. I, I think the, the that reasoning as, as was it. that they uh, the rounds popping off. They couldn't determine it safe for firefighters. You know, I don't know if a, I don't know if a battalion commander that, can say we're going anyways. That's the firefighters' call. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's the firefighters' call, not the feds' call. Yeah, but it was the feds who stopped them mm-hmm. from 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 getting in there. And then the worst, uh, yeah, not the worst. There's so many things. And then it's a crime scene. At the end of the day, correct? This whole thing is a massive yeah. crime scene, and probably a crime scene not as the way you would think about it as them being the, the perpetrators. I view it as a, a crime scene as the feds being the, yeah. the, the the main suspects. Do they do anything to preserve this crime scene? No. They do the exact opposite. What do they do this crime scene? I don't know. They push in all the walls that are that are still standing. They take all the tanks remaining with this building still on fire and they push in all the walls and they push all the material to the center of it like a bonfire to just ensure that everything goes up in flames and that anything that would have still been standing and could have been looked into investigated everything was tampered with pushed down and burnt pushed to the middle what do you think about that yeah i guess when you're the when you're the feds you can do whatever you want (laughs) I mean, it's kind of what it sounds like. That's that's the end of the siege. I just got a few more things. I know it's been a long podcast, but to me, it's, it's it, you know, you guys need to hear this. You need to hear all this and come to your own conclusions. Hopefully, it kicks off something for you to to kind of you know look into and uh, on and investigate on your own. There's a lot of things that we we didn't cover as you look into this. But let me tell you how this how this story um, how this story ends. 
the the official story after a 51 day siege is that the FBI agents, not the ATF, the FBI agents said uh, they did not fire a single shot. Uh, the ATF claimed that no shots were fired from helicopters. Um, both those uh, are proven lies. Uh, the guy in the water tower was shot by a helicopter. Um, you could you can hear the phone calls them them complaining about that you know a lot and even get into an argument with the negotiators and the negotiators kind of caught in the lie saying there were no mounted guns in those helicopters and they're like yeah there may not have been mounted guns but there were guns on those helicopters because they because they they killed one of our you know one of our friends like we were taking fire from helicopters and he had to kind of back his way out of that and say, well, yeah, well, there were no mounted guns, but yes, there may have been guns. I'm not saying there were no guns on the helicopters. The negotiator got caught in a lie on that and it got proven that they were shooting from, from helicopters. They also claimed that the Branch Davidians started the fire and that they did not start the fire. That's crazy to me when they found the incendiary grenades. Are you... Are you, like, 80-20... It was the Fed's fault. Or are you convinced? I'm just asking my opinion, it, like yeah. asking Brent. We talk, we talk, when you talk about like most likely who started the fire. Oh, who's oh yeah, I'm fifty fifty. Fifty fifty. At the end of the day, I'm fifty fifty on that. They absolutely you know could have started that fire. They had Molotov cocktails. They they it only takes you know one. Yeah. You know, what you're saying keg. is they can't clearly say we did it. But that's absolutely. But to say. But to come out on your official report and say, we didn't do it, they should have said inconclusive, we don't know. Yeah. But they said we didn't. And that I know for a fact. You know, is yeah. you cannot say that. There's no way you can say that when you threw fire Or maybe grenades. if they hadn't destroyed the building and put it out, they could find the point of origin of where things were lit on fire in the first place. They also claimed <laughs> that basically it doesn't matter who started the fire because no fire killed anyone. And everyone that died inside uh, died of suicide. No, I'll tell you some of the reasons why they felt confident enough, or or, or they may have wanted to back, you know, um, uh, backstop that story with is David Koresh was found, and he was found with a bullet in his head, or or his skull was found with a, a bullet, you know, entering the, his forehead. Uh, a lot of people they that they found they did find uh, with um, gunshot wounds to the head. So, but to say that no fire killed anyone, that's that's. That's mm. that's quite when you see the fire, that's quite uh, that's quite that's quite the tale or to say like this. Well, the fire didn't kill anyone. Well, if you're going up in flames, there's no way to go out. And you have to kill yourself, you know, to you're going to die a slow death of fire or we can end it right now. What killed you? Yeah. The fire is the reason that that they died, because. David Koresh is on video or on with the negotiators. They asked him several times, do you plan on killing yourself? Are you suicidal? And he said, no. He says it multiple times. So no one here is suicidal, but they were pushed into a corner with fire, I believe, to become suicidal. Um, during, in 1995, there was a Waco, an official Waco investigation started at a congressional level. Um, several ATF agents were caught in a lie and were fired because of it and then ironically enough when they threatened to go public they were hired back oh so public is in like oh we're not the only ones you're just trying to fire the troops we'll we'll talk about what came down i don't know what it was they were going to you know spill the beans on but whatever they were going to spill the beans on it scared the feds enough to be like ah never mind we'll rehire you wow that doesn't make a good case for the feds being above, I don't above, I don't trust board on any congressional hearings either I don't anytime I hear that there's a congressional hearing about something I'm like okay yeah. that con <laughs> that concludes my seven pages of 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 notes uh on this and uh and again I don't uh, I've said it before uh, I have to say it again I am not painting them as saints and innocent on this um they, they there's a, a but I am saying there there were faults on both sides, and at the end of the day, it's on the feds to be above board and to save you know innocent lives, and they didn't do that. How do you so the extreme, the other end of the extreme is what cops always look at is uh, well, whose fault is it? This is an extreme, not saying what happened. Whose yeah. fault is it when they arm up and they take a town and they kill a bunch of people because they went crazy because they had the weapons they weren't supposed to have? So. 
then it becomes, well, why didn't you do anything about it? So the middle ground would be, okay, if they wanted to deal with it when they dealt with it, they sh- I feel like they should have taken a lot longer to investigate. But what is your opinion on... I hate to do that to you. Right, no, no, I, I get that. That's You're basically arguing the, you know, a version of, of, of the Baker's Act, right? Like... We know we have a, you know, a, uh, is that the Baker's Act? We Baker have a dangerous, Act, yeah. yeah, a Baker Act. When you, it's liability. When you have, when you know there's a person with a gun, so now you got to go take the gun and then kind of, you know, figure it out from there. I believe this is very different because if you'd have, they already, they already knew. In my research, I can tell you what, what they stood for. They didn't want contact with the outside world. They viewed it as harmful. So there's no reason for them to go fight the outside world. It's why they're on a compound isolated by themselves. So you think I don't, they should have just been monitored? They should have been monitored. Yep. Absolutely. They, monitor. they should have been monitored. I'm not saying they shouldn't have been monitored. Absolutely. It is your job to find out, you know, uh, you know, rights and wrongs and, and, and keep the law and monitor, e- you know, you know illegal what? activity. But Cause as an American, I, I'm going to sound bad for saying it. I'm not advising to break the law or break any federal firearm laws, but it does irritate me the fact that they were – they were converting semi-automatic to automatic on their own compound away from everybody. And that's what they got at the end of it. Like out of all of this, see, we found that. And it's right. like, they could have been doing that to me. Cause personally, I don't find anything wrong with that. And here's, here's where I, where I would find wrong with that. And, uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I couldn't find any evidence of them selling fully automatic fully automatic weapons and the ATF never never claims that they that they sold them and that's you know one of the, like so you so you're proliferating illegal guns they're basically just keeping illegal guns on their own compound mm-hmm. and i know hey at the end of the day the law is the law but you know who, who you have illegal guns that you just keep at your house i don't i i, I don't think that warrants a uh, a, a a daylight siege of eight hundred, of eight hundred officers, it just doesn't. No, yeah, but slap, sl- slap the face of the government. I mean, back yeah. then, I don't think they'd do it now. I don't think a Waco would happen now. Um, oh, that's uh, and so again, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, and I don't, I'm not, I don't, I don't want this to ever happen again. Do I believe this could happen again? I can tell you this. I say it all the time. That depends on this election in 2024. I believe with you know th- who we have in power right now and their views on guns, and they would they would gladly make an example of of people like that again. Yeah. Don't don't do do you believe that's a a, a fair I, assessment? I feel like of, a lo- of our- enough time has gone by to where they're going right. to go. We're we're well since this person publicly told us no and to go fuck off. Now we're going to make it a thing. Kind of like how the uh, there was a gym owner. He's really popular in New York. Um, he he stayed open. And he said, you know, and they made a big thing and they went and they broke down his shit and they publicly arrested him in front of everybody during COVID because he kept yeah. his gym open. And like, but when you mix guns with that mm. and possibly more players in the game other than just one gym owner, that's where I feel you can get a... And then on top of that now, back then, these Ruby Ridge... In this, we're like new concepts to people. Like, whoa, right. what are these people now? It's kind of like our friend on the, that we had on the political podcast, where he said, "There's now, there's many, 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 many more pockets of people that are going to wait for that. What do you say, a powder keg You're right. to go off? That's right. And then now, there's going to be tons of Wacos rather than just one Waco. Yep, I, I think it's a it is a a good possibility of happening again, which is why it was you know so important to us. To talk about this to ensure that you know it doesn't happen again and people know what the government is capable of even though that's not that's not the everyday government it's not the it's not it's not who i paint the government as i just paint them as capable mm-hmm. of 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 this and um why this election really just has so much importance which is why we talk had our, our political podcast so be vigilant your vote matters you can change it yeah. As, yeah, as cheesy as that sounds, I I I I do believe that. And stick around because we're gonna cover a uh, couple weeks. We'll cover Ruby Ridge in the next couple weeks. I'm excited about that one. So. That's uh, 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 exciting. we're probably on order, it, but that that's that's a crazy one. We're if you probably, like this one, yeah, we're probably on a list by now. <laughs> 
I'm fine with it. 